by the Graves Foundation, which has been around for a long time, and the Let's Face It Together Foundation. The crucial difference between the two organizations is the Let's Face It Together specifically gives grants to individuals who are underinsured or uninsured. We also provide information and try to make bonds with other foundations like the Graves Foundation. The Graves Foundation is very much about education, about connection, about making, you know, as, as they said, they've got people who are ready to answer your question. If they don't know the answer, they're ready to get you, you know, connected with someone who does know the answer. In contrast, the Let's Face it Together is very community-based. It's taking, you know, money from our communities and helping people within our communities that don't have insurance to achieve what they need. So I am, um, I, I do plastics, I do orbit, I do neuro, those are all big words. Uh, I'm a board certified ophthalmologist and then I went back and did two different fellowships. One, looking at how the brain interfaces with the eye, so double vision, <coughs> decreased vision, so that's why multiple sclerosis I also deal with and other autoimmune things. Orbit means the, the box behind the eyeball, so anyone who has graves knows, knows about their box. When the box gets too full, it starts to hurt. Um, so I deal not only with graves, but other problems like tumors and fractures and that sort of thing. And then uh, plastics, as I share with uh, both, both of the other physicians here, is we all put people back together and make them feel better. And um, so both Young and, and Chase and, and myself, we all try to put people back together reconstructively, but then at the end of it, you know, aesthetically. So. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's quite a journey. So I can take someone who's got an optic nerve problem or double vision and then decompress them and then do their eyelids and then do their Botox or their laser <laughs> or whatever. So it, it's, it's good fun. And uh, I'm, I'm still affiliated with Stanford. Uh, I also care for veterans in the Palo Alto system. So thyroid eye disease is uh, a very, very difficult journey. As you all know who have it, anyone who's a family member of someone who has it, it, it just changes you. Um, Pre-disease, you have one look, you have one feel, you, you're, you're, you're you, and maybe six months, a year later, you look in the mirror and you don't even recognize the person. And your spouse will swear, you've been taken over by aliens. I mean, it's just really tough. It's, you know, you're moody, you, you just, you lose your visual function in many ways. Maybe it's just some tearing and irritation, but often it's much more than that. You, you lose brain function, and that brain fog can stick around for a long time. Notice when the TSI is very high, people really have difficulty functioning um, and um, being on message, having task. Um, Self-confidence, obviously, in social interactions because suddenly you don't look like you used to. And you start reacting to how people, you, even if they're maybe not looking at your eyes, you, you, you become certain they are. And so it's, it's just a really, really tough um, disease to care for. Uh, I feel blessed to be able to care for patients. Um, I fortunately had pretty minimal eye things, but it helps me completely relate to my patients because I remember the ache and the tearing and the just I, I thought they'd never feel normal again. And they, I can never wear contact lenses like I used to, um, but you do get back close to where you had been. As we discussed, uh, you can get, so there's Graves' disease, and that's why it was called Graves' ophthalmopathy, um, Graves' eye disease. Uh, but Graves was described by a guy named Graves, <laughs> and he described the disorder of being hyperthyroid, having this eye problem, and then also having edema of the front part of your leg. It's called myxedema right along here. But you can actually get a lot of the eye problems from other things. So thyroid cancer, it's been associated with radiation for that, or just the cancer itself. The Hashimoto's, which is a, that inflammatory process. Um, and then hypothyroidism it can also be seen with subacute thyroiditis. As you know, the thyroid sits uh, right up here, and Chase will be chatting a little bit about the options for um, things other than just medical therapy to make your thyroid be good. I see a lot of patients in the pink category. Uh, the patients, you know, if you already have Graves, uh, a lot of times people will get what's going on, but as many of you <coughs> voiced, you most of you go to six, eight, 10, 12 doctors over the course of several months to years before you get to where you need to be with the right providers. And that's where the Graves Foundation can be really helpful is if you're just, if you haven't gotten there, they can help connect you with physicians and they have a physician registry. Um, the hardest thing is for patients, you know, that the blood work tends to follow. And so if you're, if you're having problems but the doctors don't see the problems, you may be given the impression they don't believe you um, and that you must be making up your symptoms. 
Um, it's definitely common. I mean, it's, it's more women than men. It's unfortunately in our most productive years, 30s, 40s, 50s. Uh, it's one of the leading causes of disability from a visual dysfunction standpoint. Any age is possible. I've had babies with it. I've had 90-year-olds with it. But it's, yeah, it's typically kind of in our, our middle years. Unfortunately, um, anytime you have the disease and you're in the wrong group, so men tend to do worse than women in terms of the severity of the course of their disease. Um, if you're older, you tend to do worse. Uh, radioactive iodine, it's got a parenthesis around it because if you get it in the right way, welcome, come on in. <laughs> if, you, if you get it and you have IV steroids, um, you can, there are ways, and you get the right amount of treatment, you can prevent having the eyes become worsened. The worst thing, though, is untreated hypothyroidism or smoking. Uh, those are both things you can deal with. And, and I'd like to add as a third one, uh, the vitamin D we were talking about. So, welcome. <laughs> it's been a challenge. The, uh, so, vitamin D interfaces with um, the untreated hypothyroidism and makes things worse, and it gets that TSI up. Smoking is just bad, and you might and you might think, well, smoking's bad because of why? Smoking's bad for all autoimmune problems because it causes uh, upregulation of all the the little things floating around in your serum that want to attack your eyes, want to attack your thyroid. As far as medical management of Gray's disease, there's a variety of things. I know someone was saying they're trying to decide what to do. You know, homeopathic's not working, or you know, you're, you're having symptoms again. It's really hard because when you look at the medical literature, radioactive iodine looks evil, and it is evil if performed inappropriately. If, it, if you're given too much or you're not given it with the right IV steroids um, before it, during it, and after it, you can have your eyes get dramatically worse, and they'll be, you know, you basically it's like a, a, a torch and a little gasoline. So you don't want to you don't want to have the wrong kind of radioactive iodine. But that said. In the right hands, with the right dosing, it is still an option for some people and you won't get worse. Um, PTU, not, not used as much now as methimazole. Methimazole really, if you're hitting a year of using methimazole, it's time to talk to your endocrinologist and say, okay, what are we doing next? What am I going to do next? Because you, if it's not gonna work by 12 or 18 months, it's never gonna work. And so then the question is, are you gonna be on it forever? That happens in some um, European preference studies, but that typically is at the point at which I say, Dr. Lay, would you please talk to this patient about the options for surgery? Because, you know, I, I, I love to be minimally invasive, and I'll talk to you about some minimally invasive ways of helping the eyes. Um, but at some point, you got to just say, okay, this isn't, this isn't good for me. This isn't working for me. I need to get productive again. And you can't get productive if your thyroid thing is going all over. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. If you found a dose of methemazole which has stabilized, mm -hmm. are you still suggesting that after, if you've hit that 18-month 18, 18 period, that you should seek something else out? Meaning... I understand what you're saying. If so you if you're a youth, if you're... you're okay stay. So if, if here's how I'm okay with you being on methemazole for the rest of your life. Your thyroid levels are stable, and you clinically are stable. Because I'm, I, I, you know, I know we have these blood tests, and that's all nice and helpful, but if you're not stable, that's what matters. It matters to me, are you, you know, are you having a brain fog? Are you having any visual dysfunction? Are you in pain? You know, are you having double, anything like that? Then I don't care what the numbers say. But if you're on methimazole and you're dead stable, nah, not going in, like, because the, the worst thing for your eyes in particular uh, is the, the looping, going up and down and, you know, stopping and starting. Um, it, it, especially as I was saying abroad, they use methimazole long term in patients specifically in that category. And men tend to be more likely to do that than women. Any other questions? That's good. So, anybody here smoke? Please say. California, it's a lot easier. I was um, in practice at, uh, in the Army for 15 years, and this, there was a lot of smoking, and then I went to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a lot of smoking. And smoking is just bad. It makes everything that we do less effective. So my, my medical therapeutics don't work as well. My surgery doesn't work as well. My radiation doesn't work as well. And it's because it's not just the smoke flying up and bothering your eyes. It's actually ramping up your autoimmunity. Just like a low vitamin D will do the same thing, um, or a hypothyroidism will do the same thing, it's ramping you up. So you also want to avoid secondhand smoke, which actually has become so much easier, especially here. 
This is a typical clinical presentation. Um, as I was saying, we all share cosmetic interests. And you know, when I have a patient in their 20s wanting an eyelid lift or fat removed, I, I immediately assume they have thyroid eye disease because this doesn't make sense. Um, a lot of times patients will you know, pop around from their optometrist to you know, Sears, four eyes, whatever, um, with you know, contact lens intolerance, changes in their glasses, that kind of thing, very, very common. And so they can just be bopping around until somebody goes, oh, you've got that look. And, and now, it, once you have thyroid disease, don't you see people mm -hmm. like in Safeway or wherever, and you go, I can help you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> There's a look, and it doesn't matter what their, their blood tests. You just go, yeah, you got it. Um, there tends to be a vague orbital ache, so sometimes people think that they got sinus disease, they think they've got dry eyes, they get told they have glaucoma, which is really bad because then they get put on glaucoma drops that make them worse. And then a really characteristic thing is to start to have double vision early in the morning for the first half hour. You're just not quite being able to read the newspaper quite as well. The bulging then tends to be the next thing. Sorry, my slides are a bit yellow today. Um, the bulging happens, but what patients notice, it, you know, they're noticing they're looking different, but they notice when they touch their eyes, they just feel really firm. And that's because the tissue behind your eyeball is changing. Your muscles, yeah, your muscles are getting bigger, but your fat's getting harder. A new kind of fat is being deposited that's much more uh, like a tumor almost when I go to remove it than it is like real fat. So very characteristic. This is, you know, the redness, the swelling of the active hot phase. This is the hardest time. Um, this is when most of my patients, and Sarah, I remember, was <laughs> her poor husband was saying, she's, we were in Paris, she didn't want to shop. There's something wrong. <laughs> I mean, it just gives you an ache and a tearing, and you're so unhappy. And it's, it's really hard. Each person goes through a longer or shorter phase of this disease. So for those of you who are new to this, you know, we talk about this curve. It's, you know, no one knows how long the curve is. No one knows how high your curve is. Everybody's curve is different. You might have a curve that's six months. Woo! Or you might be like this and have prolonged symptomatology. So it just depends. And so when you're in this phase, people say, what can I do? And so what my research interest is actually trying to look at a paradigm and say, the way we're dealing with this, is this really the way we should be doing it? If you think about rheumatoid arthritis or so many of the other autoimmune diseases, we don't like wait until they're swollen and deformed and then go break their hands. We intervene. And so the question is, what is a good early intervention and should we be moving in that way? And so the Graves Foundation and other um, foundations and, and research groups are, are you know, working together to try to advance the, the treatment of this disorder. This is the look. That person does not have anything other than thyroid eye disease, you know, and, and the characteristic thing is when you look down, that stare is still there, and that doesn't happen with contact lenses or any other things. We have, Bob was lucky enough to get two things, <laughs> and so sometimes you get not only thyroid eye disease, but you get myasthenia gravis. And so they, so once you have one autoimmune disease, you can have a second one. And so if you're being followed and suddenly you have drooping of your eyelids, you have myasthenia, for sure, absolutely. <coughs> if you have diplopia that's not present in the morning, but rather present over the course of the day, you have myasthenia. And then it's even more complex to try to deal with everything. What's yep. diplopia? Diplopia is double vision. Thank you, Chase. <laughs> So ptosis is drooping and uh, double vision is diplopia. So the muscle involvement, um, a characteristic thing is ha hard to look either to the right or extreme left or up or both if you're really lucky. Um, this, this is a CT scan on that top and it's just showing the muscles are very, very big. Um, and those, does anybody have a pointer? I don't think I have a pointer up here. The, the, if you look up here, the muscles should be about, so the muscles are the things that are going around in a circle. They should be about 20% of the size that you're seeing there. So this is a very characteristic thyroid. And that's why you get the pain. You get the pain because you're, you, there's just too much stuff in the box, which the box is the bony orbit. I'm just seeing I, see I don't see one. Use the mouse. That's, I that could. <laughs> This is just, uh, again, stressing when you look up, your pressure can go up. So you, while you do want to be seen by an eye care specialist, you don't want to be put on glaucoma medication unless you truly have glaucoma. So glaucoma is just the increasing pressure in the eye. And in some people, this causes damage to their optic nerve, and so they're put on drops. The problem with drops in patients with graves or any of the thyroid imbalances is those drops have preservatives, and those preservatives, again, are just like gasoline on a fire. 
it's going to make the inflammation worse. So beware if, you're, if your eye practitioner tries to put you on, on drops unless you have a family history of glaucoma. You're, if you go to an uh, eye practitioner, you're going to have uh, not only the CT scan, I think I can point now. So here's the eyeball, and here are the, the muscles. And the muscles are much too big. You can see here's your sinus, so that's why having increased sinus disorder, which happens with low vitamin D, makes more inflammation, more likelihood you're going to have problems. Um, but this is, this is your optic nerve, and the optic nerve can get crushed right back here as, as the muscles are getting too big, and this is the orbit. Um, so your practitioner will do different testing to see whether your vision's affected. And this is showing a visual field where you sit and you push a button and you're past one eye and the other. And then this, um, there's this is a HRT or there's a bunch of acronyms, OCT, where you just sit and they take a picture and it shows, shows your optic nerves. Has anybody had these kind of testing? Do you have any questions about what you were told about your results? Everybody doing okay? These, oh, I highly recommend you keep your own full. You know, keep a binder with your own results. We doctors would love to be perfect, but sometimes things get lost. God forbid your, your chart gets lost, and then all these years of records are, are not there. So I, I think it's good to keep a, your own CD of your CT. So if you get an imaging study, not only keep the, the, C, the, the report, keep the CD, because that's helpful down the road, but also keep copies of, of any testing that your doctors do, including your blood work. So labs you'll need, from my standpoint, I, I primarily follow the TSH and the TSI um, for looking at this, the status of the thyroid and the eye activity. But I also, as we talked about, think that the vitamin D is very crucial and, and you should have that evaluated. So back to the classic teaching. So the classic teaching is extremely frustrating for anyone who's got thyroid eye disease. You're told <coughs> it's going to get better. If you're blind, we're not going to do anything. I, we'll do something. If you're not blind, you know, so if you're not in the severe, got to have something done right away, a lot of doctors will just say, you got to write it out. And it's, it, it, it shouldn't be. Why should it be that the year 2012, we have so many different things that we could try. Why should you just have to sit and wait? Well, the theory is you're going to just get inflamed and you're going to you're going to get better and the point at which anything should be done is after you've started to get better, not when you're in that active hot phase. And that's that's very very debated. So this is this is not a worldwide um, way of looking at it. So if you look at the Europeans or Brazilians, they've been much more forward thinking in terms of jumping on it and trying to do things to prevent you from having your eyes go out farther or your double vision getting worse or you're you dealing with pain every single day. So this patience, reassurance, timely intervention that feels so patronizing when some doctors say it, it's, you know, you got to at least say why. Is there, is there nothing I can do? Is there not a study I can, I can get involved in? Because there's all sorts of interesting things that, that get tested. Um, as far as other things, so we talked about the smoking cessation. You need to avoid anything with preservatives. So that means that visine or murine that might make your eyes look not so red, not good. It's toxin, should just say. It's so bad for you because it's just ramping up that inflammatory cascade. So you want to avoid those. You can do other things. You can try tinted lenses. So you can either get the glasses that go slightly photo gray, or you can get them tinted if you're having to work in an environment like this where the lights are bothering you. Um, avoid salt and MSG. So MSG is what's in a lot of the Chinese food and, and, and a lot of things these days. Um, those are going to make you retain fluid, which is going to make you have double vision in the morning. Um, so especially at night, you know, it's not the time to have the, the pepperoni pizza. You can have prisms. So let's say you do have double vision. You only have double vision for the first first hour of the morning. You can have little prisms that you put in an envelope and you put it, you just stick on the back of your glasses each morning. And so there are things out there. So whenever anybody says there's nothing, you should just be observed and we're going to wait. Just, you know, there, there can be times that you, we can help you with other things. At nighttime, you want to elevate your head and you want to, you know, you could get one of those little things that you, you know, wedgie pillows. Uh, if your eyes are opening, which is a common problem, you can use saran wrap um, rather than taping. So you can put ointment in, just put a, just a piece of saran wrap like that. that it's, if you have to get up to go to the bathroom, you just peel it off, put another one on. It's, it does, it's less irritating than taping, or you can wear an eye mask. So there are definitely things you can do to make yourself feel, feel better. Here's some of the things that I've um, been looking at recently. So Botox, which everybody knows 
is kind of like the cosmetic thing, has, was actually first described to be used in patients with double vision. And then Restylane, or hyaluronic acid, is more and more being used. So here's the, a new option for eyelid closure at bedtime. This, these are tranquilized. And what's nice about these is they come with this little insert. And the insert gets warm. And so your eyes, you get tearing and you get irritation because your tears aren't normal. They're evaporating too fast. So what this does is stimulates your own tear glands that make a little bit more oil, stabilizes your tears. So you can either sleep in these or just wear them when your eyes are particularly irritated. The, uh, they're, they're at iEcho.com. Um, they're like about 75 bucks. It, it was designed not by a Graves patient, but somebody with dry eyes. Um, but they, they seem to be nice and effective. This is kind of a gross slide, sorry. Um, but yeah, I can flip your eyelid, and I can put a little bit of the Botox in, and I can get the eyelid so that it's going to close more, and it's going to look more equal as it had before. I'll show you a couple pictures. The other thing I can do is I can take this stuff. Hyaluronic acid is actually what's in your skin, it's in your joints, it's in your eyeball, uh, and it's anti-inflammatory. And so I can take it, and this is just a, showing, this is your eye would be right here. I can put it right across this structure and make it slightly heavier. I can also inject it on the undersurface and suppress some of the inflammation that's part of that active phase. So there's more and more interesting things that are being done in a, a minimally invasive way to try to make you more comfortable while you're waiting um, for the process to evolve. So here's patients who just have had minimally invasive injections. So it's not perfect, but it's going to make the person more comfortable as they're waiting for their definitive surgery. This is this kind of patient is that particularly likes the, that hyaluronic acid. You can just put a little bit on the eyelid, and then at bedtime you can see it closes more. Again, this isn't forever. The hyaluronic acid will stick around for about a year. If you don't like it, it can be dissolved and removed. Um, so it's uh, it's an option that's out there. So game changer. Will we ever figure out an early intervention that makes it so that I don't say to the rheumatoid or arthritis patient, let's wait until you're completely deformed, then I'm going to take a hammer, <coughs> I'm going to chip you and put you back together. I mean, it is kind of archaic what we do with Graves' disease, and it hasn't changed a whole lot. So I've been, I first cared for my uh, thyroid patients was way back 25 years ago when the Bushes were at the White House, um, and we're both at Walter Reed. Um, but the standard of care for uveitis, multiple sclerosis, all these other inflammatory things is jump in early and treat. I'm hoping at some point I'll be able to come here and give you a, a better lecture saying we figured out what to treat you with and who to treat. The biggest problem is these, these things we use are toxic. How many people have been on prednisone? Not fun. Okay, a lot of side effects. The other immunosuppressives, um, rituximab, I mean, there's deaths associated with them. So, I mean, ideally we wouldn't be doing this by putting it in your vein because we want to get it to your eye for the most part. So we know oral prednisone is tough. There are the other ways. So the current therapy for pulse steroids is very interesting. It's a relatively low dose. It's once a week for six weeks. This just means steroids put behind the eyeball. And this is something I commonly do if I'm taking to surgery anyway. Topical steroids, not so good. Why? Because they have to be preserved. So yeah, those preservatives are the same thing as glaucoma. So they tend to have a problem. Intranasal steroids, I've had a number of my patients use them and they seem to be helpful. Why would that work? Because the nose, you're going up the nose and you get, it gets sucked by the fat behind the eyeball. So there are things we can use, but it, what we'd ideally want to do is be able to say, okay, <coughs> this person is miserable. What can I do to make her feel you know, more comfortable? And what can I do it on a local level? We know that the, if we did locally, uh, it'd be much better. We wouldn't have any of these bad things happen. So one of the things um, in the University of Michigan, um, they're involved in the Graves Foundation, actually the docs who got me involved, um, have been looking for a number of years at stopping the conversations at a local level. And so right now we're looking at trying to create eluding devices. So it's an eluding device. It just means a piece of something that gets put behind your eye in a very non-invasive way, ideally in the clinic, just put it there, and it just slowly, so it's a slow release and slow release for maybe a year or two years, and makes it so that instead of you having to go through a year, two years, three years of discomfort, we could possibly stop the process. 
you could implant these. Ideally, you know, as I was saying, it could be just something that's placed right here, and it would just elude over time. We know devices placed here, it'll elude all the way across the orbit. So whether we're using a steroid or, or maybe something like rituximab, uh, it, it would be possible and it could happen. These um, MEMS devices were in Silicon Valley. Genentech is pretty, pretty uh, top notch in terms of cutting edge stuff. These are being developed. And so right now we have a number of eluding devices that are coming out for dry eye, for glaucoma. We have MEMS devices that are able to sample genetic data and then deliver the appropriate drug. So it might be that the medication you should have is not the medication you need. And so this device could say, okay, what's your molecular you know, genetics? And okay, I'm gonna give the, this drug for you and you need this drug. And so ideally, we'd come back to you, you know, 10 years from now or five years maybe, and be able to say, okay, we got something. We got something that's gonna make a, make a big difference. But in summary, you guys have a journey. And tonight I'm hoping we can help you know, answer some of your questions and it, you know, give you a little optimism that people are trying very hard to find ways to make your life better and faster to normal. Um, Bob Pomiato, uh, he was always he was like, can't we do something now? <laughs> you know, it's so frustrating. It's, I would love to be able to say, I, I, I got this thing, here you go, you put it in your eye, you go to sleep, but you know, it, it's still, we have a journey on the research end also to get you guys to where, where you want to be. So, any questions? Yes. Uh, do a lot of people suffer from the bright lights or the glare? Yes. I don't know, before. Mm -hmm. So, yes. During, so, yeah. so what happens is your lacrimal gland, which is located right here, gets infiltrated with the same cells that go behind your eyeball, and it makes your tears wrong. It makes them so they don't have the right protein and they're not stable. So they start evaporating too fast. And when that happens, one of the first symptoms is lights just seem too bright. Right. Yeah. And just recently, uh, to use myself as an example, they decided I had uh, cataracts. Mm -hmm. So I've had the cataract surgery and I can see well, although I'm still wearing glasses. Mm -hmm. But now the light is worse. worse. I'm more sensitive and I'm figuring, why did I let him do the cataract surgery? Because now I'm <coughs> putting sunglasses over my glasses, I'm wearing a visor, and I'm looking at a silly jerk, you know, walking around with all this stuff on my eyes. It's bad enough that I have the uh, graves with the protrusion. Will this subside? Yes. Or do I have to do something for No, it? so the good thing is your brain is plastic, and so anytime you change something, it will, with time, usually make an alteration. Man, yeah, but it'll, it'll, take, it'll take usually three to six months. Oh, all right. At least there's hope. It's coming. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. With double vision, I don't understand a process where one day you wake up and it's gone. And it was there like all day long. I had glasses with prisms. And then all of a sudden it wasn't. What was like a muscle just go boink? And change or something. So what what likely happened is you had one muscle that was bigger than the other and stronger, <coughs> and you fortunately had that other muscle that was balancing it get inflamed too, to an equal degree. <laughs> so that's good. Yeah, yeah, that's good. The um, how many people have double vision right now? And it, when is your double vision worst? Late at night or early in the evening. So if it's late at night, you should get an acetylcholine receptor on you because it shouldn't be late at night for thyroid unless it's double vision really due to your tear film. It should be mainly in the morning. It do, this does happen. It can come on one day and be there and then go away. It can also just flip. Like one day you're seeing it's crossed, the next day you're like, so, I mean, different, different, it depends on where the fluid is, um, how you slept, how you positioned yourself, that sort of thing. Um, definitely going to altitude um, is gonna make you um, retain fluid. So there are things you can do, like let's say you know you need to be at a big meeting. There, you can take a diuretic that will make your double vision not so bad after you go to uh, go to altitude. Any other questions? Yeah, um, you mentioned the Botox for lid retraction. That's a temporary solution, <coughs> right? But it only lasts last for how long? Three to six months. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and it it when paired with the hyaluronic acid, it can last longer because you get kind of a weighted effect. But, you know, and it, it depends, you know, for some people that are in the public eye, that's gonna make the difference between them feeling comfortable in their job. Um, uh, and, and other people, they're, you know, they're scared of the needle. Um, unfortunately, um, insurance companies 
haven't quite figured out how they're going to pay for that. So a lot of times that that fee is a self-pay fee, and that's one of the things our, our foundation provides is product when an insurance company doesn't understand that it's a medically necessary thing. Yes. Uh, if I had been diagnosed sooner, I know it's a hypothetical question, uh, because I had like Hashimoto's and then Graves, um, and then I sort of had the start of a goiter. So there were three choices, either medicine and uh, <coughs> surgery to remove the thyroid, or else the um, radioactive iodine. Mm -hmm. And uh, the doctor made the decision for me. I said, no, he said, it's too slow with the pills for you, and the, you don't want the surgery. And he said, you really need it, because um, at that time, I was thrilled. I mean, I was losing weight like crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and, I didn't, and I knew that I wasn't e eating any differently. Mm -hmm. But I mean, 10 pounds in two weeks, I went, woo -hoo! You know, <laughs> this is great. But um, I had that uh, radioactive mm -hmm. iodine, and then I was still going at 300 times normal. Mm -hmm. And then I had another dose, and that's when the eyes popped. Right. So what you're saying is that the medication or the amount that they gave me or how they gave it to me was incorrect for my... <coughs> I would say that knowledge evolves with time and unfortunately patients um, are why we call it practicing medicine. Yeah, they do. <coughs> that we learn. Um, but yeah, when I was in training, people would get one, two, maybe even three doses really? with no steroids. Never mind IV steroids and yeah, their eyes would... Yeah, I didn't get the steroids. I yeah. like just the radioactive then went back to work mm -hmm. and then eventually I had the red eyes and the all oh, and I thought what is it so I went to of course an eye doctor mm -hmm. and he said oh you have an infection <laughs> and he was treating me with the, the bright lights of the infection and I was like oh my god this is not fun and then I went back and he said oh you're, you're better I said no I'm not and he said I think we better send you to another specialist and he called it right away. Yeah, yeah. And that's, I mean, that's also hard. Is so because I have a narrow focus of who I see, like to make the joke about the Safeway, I mean, I just want to tap them. I can help you. Um, yeah, you, you're going to go to generalists sometimes, and they have a lot on their plate. They can see a lot of different kinds of patients, and so it doesn't just jump out at them, mm -hmm. you know, in the same way. But once they've, they've protruded like this, or once they've popped, there's an operation, I think, that you can perform to put them back in the socket. Our next speaker. Oh. <laughs> but my one doctor discouraged me. He said you could go blind. You could go blind from your cataract surgery. That's the true. incidence of so blindness after cataract surgery is much higher than after decompression. Really? So, yeah. 